thank you all so much for coming back so promptly. Uh, it means we can have a, a really vibrant session uh, this morning. We've already had a, a great head start with the discussion earlier about networks. But uh, I'd just like to thank all of you who have come here today to the Senate House, but also I'd like to give a, a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining on Zoom. Um, I think it's the great opportunity uh, post-pandemic to involve a conversation that can genuinely go around the world. Uh, very exciting to, to have so many people joining us here today. Um, before we, we actually begin with, with the meat of uh, this morning's second session, um, I'd just like to let you know you can now tweet on Commonwealth Roundtable, at Commonwealth Roundtable. And uh, if you'd like to share comments and thoughts, um, the Roundtable will then pick them up um, and put them on the Twitter feed, which goes out under the Roundtable's auspices. Um, this is a really pivotal moment for us to be discussing Commonwealth matters. Uh, the session on leadership is particularly important as we approach the first Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting after, after the onset of the COVID pandemic. It is, of course, two years later than originally scheduled, but uh, it's got the benefit of coinciding with the Queen's Diamond Jubilee year. So uh, some very exciting and involved discussions have gone forth. I think the meeting in Kigali is going to be historic. Uh, we're certainly going to see an exciting leadership contest for uh, the Secretary General role. This period also, of course, marks the end of the tenure of the current chair in office. Uh, it's a position that has been occupied for longer than usual. Uh, we've already discussed in this morning's first session some of the uh, implications and perceptions of having such a, a long period of one chair in office. The Commonwealth, of course, now has a trio of really important leadership officers, the head of the Commonwealth, um, of course, Her Majesty the Queen. I think um, there is uh, universal praise for her extraordinary commitment and the immense contribution she has made in bringing the Commonwealth together um, in a, a really important role going forward in the modern world where we face such hardships, such strife uh, all around us. And um, I think all of us uh, really appreciate that role that Her Majesty has been playing. The Secretary General is the second really important role for the Commonwealth in terms of the leadership. And um, with that in mind, the contest for uh, the successor to the Secretary General's role is going to be incredibly important. It also may throw uh, an important spotlight on the leadership of Paul Kagame in uh, Rwanda. Um, and I think some very interesting discussions will come forth, not only about the Commonwealth, but the Commonwealth in the wider world, not least the Commonwealth in Africa, uh, first and foremost. Um, the chair in office is, of course, the third post, which um, has elicited a great deal of really uh, animated discussion. Not all good, of course, um, because uh, the element of diversity and the interchange and the process of getting new ideas, some people feel, has been compromised in, in this last period when the pandemic has disrupted the natural flow of the Commonwealth calendar. But um, I hope we will be able to, to touch on all these three elements and much more in the following discussion. 
I'm delighted to have with me today uh, Philip Murphy, who is a professor at the University of London. And uh, Philip, of course, is a veteran observer and commentator on the Commonwealth. He's made some really um, important views uh, into the public domain. He's aired some controversial ideas, um, and I, I hope he'll forgive me for uh, highlighting that. But um, not least, most recently, uh, there's been a focus on uh, the role of the monarchy, and uh, I think that's, that's going to be a very important element of this morning's discussion. Um, I have with me on my left um, Guy Hewitt, who is also a veteran Commonwealth player, former uh, High Commissioner to the Court of St. James for Barbados, and um, has always contributed in a very vibrant way uh, to Commonwealth discussions. And uh, I'm also delighted that we have with us from Cyprus, joining us, um, Euripides Yevri Viades. And uh, Euripides, of course, served as High Commissioner to London for six years. And uh, he is a career diplomat, very engaged in the value of the Commonwealth. So uh, with these three uh, discussants, uh, we're going to have a, a very animated and focused discussion. Um, I'd like to begin first with Philip uh, for some opening remarks and some ideas to really get the juices flowing. Philip. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Leadership in the Commonwealth. There is a structural problem, a deep structural problem with leadership in the Commonwealth, and it is not going to be resolved anytime soon. And there are three, the, 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 the nine, I think nine <coughs> elements to this, and I'm going to whip through them very quickly, and we can pick up on them uh, over questions. One is history. The Commonwealth is the product of a collapsing empire. The forces forming it were centrifugal. There was never any willingness to transfer powers back to the center. Indeed, it wasn't clear where the center was anymore. Um, that is a longer term trajectory, which is not going to be turned around anytime soon. Second, the weakness of the Secretary General role. The Commonwealth Secretariat was established in 1965 against the better instincts of a number of major donor countries, including the United Kingdom. Therefore, the powers of the Secretary General were kept vague and relatively weak. That has not changed. The most effective Secretary Generals have pushed against that, but the default position is weakness. Thirdly, leadership involves making choices. The Secretary General cannot make choices, or makes it, it finds it very difficult to make choices. And there are two main reasons for that. Firstly, because member states value the Commonwealth insofar as they value it for a wide variety of different reasons. Um, so that uh, you can see this actually in, in Kamina Johnson-Smith's pitches to the next Secretary General. She's making the classic mistake that, that really everyone in the past has done of saying she'll do everything because she has to say that, because she has to appeal to 54 different countries with very different agendas. And the, the other reason, of course, is because of the way the Commonwealth relates to the broader so-called civil society through a series of subject-specific groups which are currently piling on their own particular issues to the agenda in Rwanda next, next, next month, as they do every time. Um, everyone knows, particularly with such a poorly funded organisation as the Commonwealth, in order to achieve anything it has to hone down onto one or two things it can do well, and it will never be able to do that. Fourthly, the members need to be prepared to be led. And unfortunately, the costs of leaving the Commonwealth, the immediate costs, are so negligible that it's too easy to exit. 
as Gambia did, as Zimbabwe did, when they were put under any pressure. That makes Secretary Generals very reluctant to crack the whip, insofar as there is a whip. Um, and if members are reluctant to be led, it seems that the Commonwealth Secretariat is also <laughs> reluctant to be led. Whenever it's been faced with a reforming Secretary General, like Don McKinnon, or indeed Patricia Scotland in her early years, you could hear the, the briefings, the anonymous briefings across the, the press, and particularly the, the recently the sort of pro-Johnson uh, press. Um, it seems like a very difficult organisation to lead. Sixthly, the chair in office role is an experiment which had failed as early as 2011 when the eminent persons group recommended that it be abolished. Since then, there have been three other good reasons to abolish it. Mahinda Rajapaksa, Boris Johnson and Paul Kagame. Um, Johnson has been in that position for longer than anyone else, and his sole contribution has been systematically to undermine the Secretary General. Um, that post should go. Um, the headship, the headship is now a mess. Um, uh, the palace lobbied um, very hard and very long for that succession, and they got what they wanted in 2018. But it is clear that the tide is turning against having a member of the royal family as a symbolic head of the Commonwealth. And Prince William pretty much admitted that after his not very successful visit to the Caribbean earlier this year. So this is, it looks like it's going to continue, but it's very badly damaged. Eighth, um, there has always been a problem, going back to what I said earlier, as to who leads. I mean, Krishna and Srinivasan made this point very, very well a number of years ago. If Britain isn't prepared to lead, and it isn't, because it doesn't want to appear to be in some sort of neo-colonial role, then who does? It's a bit of an orphan. The, the answer has often been, well, India, most people in the Commonwealth are Indian citizens. But, but the Commonwealth has always been very marginal uh, to, to India's foreign policy, uh, and, and never more so than, than now. And finally, ninthly, the, the, the Commonwealth is involved in uh, a classic resource-led downward spiral. Um, it, it, it's been short of the, the money that it needs really since the 1990s, but over the last decade, the, the situation has reached crisis point. Um, and it's partly reached crisis point because of the, the Commonwealth Secretary's own bad decisions. Um, Canada withdrew major funding in 2013 because of the decision to hold the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in, in Sri Lanka, and that money hasn't returned. So it's a classic problem. You don't have the resources to act effectively. You don't act, act effectively, therefore the resources are cut even further. Very, very quickly, what are the solutions? When, when one comes out with this, um, uh, people in Commonwealth circles often come out with these two magic words, Sonny Ramphel. Um, a charismatic leader with a, a well-stocked address book and a bit of vim. Uh, will we'll, we'll somehow conquer all of these structural problems. To which my two words are Don, Don McKinnon, um, who I think was a very similar beast, but acting at a very different time, without the moral certainties of the crusade against apartheid, when all of that situation was, was settling down in a very messy way, um, and, and really wasn't able to deal with the structural problems that I, I presented. The chair in office should be abolished, but it won't, because there'll always be two powerful people, the current chair in office and the next chair in office, who will want it to continue. The headship will go, but it won't, not any time soon. The Secretary General, the one thing one could do is avoid the situation when a Secretary General has to run for a second term. 
That means that they're incapable of acting as they should be acting as the custodian of Commonwealth values because they have to, to get a majority of those 54 states and can't push the boat out too far. That's something that could be done. Whether it will be done, who knows? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. For that. I think there were some really important issues to, to examine. Uh, the question of consensus, which mm. comes up time and again, and the need to appease, uh, certainly, certainly uh, make, make the offer appealing to the 54 different member states of the Commonwealth. That's got to be an inherent problem. Um, similarly, the structural issues that you mentioned um, and thirdly, an interesting point about India, because, of course, it was India in the form of uh, Prime Minister Nehru who was responsible for asking Her Majesty the Queen formally if she would take on the Commonwealth upon the death of her father. Um, so it's interesting that India today still could play a really pivotal role. Um, for some reaction to uh, Philip's remarks and um, from the perspective of a, a veteran Commonwealth diplomat, I'd like to go to Cyprus now and uh, Euripides um, for your perspectives on the Commonwealth and the leadership in particular. Euripides, you have the floor. Well, uh, first of all, uh, uh Greetings to all. It's nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for, uh, uh, for this timely event. Um, uh, I am a practitioner and I will speak based on my own experience for the last, uh, for the last six years as Cyprus's uh, High Commissioner to London. Uh, the Commonwealth was one of many subjects that High Commissioners have to deal when they are uh, in London. I chair the uh, executive committee, but I also chaired for a good part the, the board, of, uh, board of Governors. So my experience is, uh, Philip, uh, of that of the practitioner and not that of the academic. So I apologize if my remarks are, no, are not so well structured as yours, but I will throw in uh, for whatever they're worth. First, it was mentioned about the election of the SG in Kigali. Certainly, that's going to be the hottest issue to be decided by the heads. And it will, it will undoubtedly take a lot of the oxygen in the room. Uh, uh, they, it's a common, secret, a common secret that the incumbent will certainly give a huge fight to the bitter end. Uh, uh, several countries, including the United Kingdom, India, Trinidad and Tobago, from what I've been able to read in the press, are supporting the Jamaican candidate. Uh, and of course, we all know that there is no CARICOM uh, position. Uh, the CARICOM position is split. Uh, um, Belize, as chair, uh, said that the member states are free to uh, to vote for the candidate of their choice. But Belize itself has uh, also endorsed uh, Jamaica. Uh, we uh, the secretary general needs 28 votes to get elected. Uh, um, so uh, um, whoever wins, uh, I should also mention Tuvalu, the third candidate, which doesn't seem to be picking much structure. Now, uh, uh, whoever wins the election, the next uh, Secretary General must stabilize the institution above everything else. It has, must be consensus oriented and not divisive. Uh, heal the often rift that exists between the ABCs and the rest. Most importantly, uh, uh, the new Secretary General or, or the election of the current Secretary General uh, must resolutely uh, uh, push the reforms forward, uh, forward that have been adopted by the foreign ministers in CFAM in 2019 and, and expected to be endorsed by the heads in Kigali. Uh, in, in, the Secretary General must have vision. Uh, this is where we should be going. These are the means as to how we were going to get there. Uh, and let me give, say, a punchline, which I said it before. The Secretary General must be more of a secretary than a general. Um, it must engage in participative and transformative leadership when it comes to leading. 
including the Secretariat, as opposed to an authoritative one. Uh, leadership, of course, in the Commonwealth is multi-layered, as it has been mentioned. It is not just about the SG and the, uh, the uh, Commonwealth Secretary General the, the, uh, and the ComSec, the Secretariat. Uh, one should obviously not focus on just them alone. Uh, leadership in the Commonwealth context should be viewed in a holistic, all-encompassing manner. And these somehow must be harnessed uh, uh, and come together in order to achieve the overall strategic goals of the organization. It has been mentioned about Her Majesty. Uh, uh, she cannot be matched when she inevitably leaves the scene. Uh, we have a good idea what uh, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, will focus upon on sustainability or sustainable markets, urbanization, smart cities, climate change. All these are critical to achieve. But as it has been said by Philip, for how long will the Commonwealth have uh, a, a, a royal being uh, the head of the Commonwealth? We know what, what, what happened last time and some different ideas that some members had. But of course, in the end, everybody agreed on, on His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Now, another issue of leadership is, of course, when it comes to Chogoms. The heads are our sovereigns. We serve them. They must be fully engaged, but of course this is easier said than done because they have so much on their plate uh, right now, uh, especially in this day and age where multilateralism, as has been said, is falling apart in, in the Sims. Uh, we are witnessing tectonic shifts in the international, international system. Uh, the heads must continue to give the strategic direction of the organization, while of course the foreign ministers are fully engaged receiving recommendations from the high commissioners who are on the ground. Now, the chair in office has been mentioned and, 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 uh, and the work of the eminent persons that uh, suggested at some point that it should be abolished. And Philip uh, says that it will not. Uh, I certainly agree that it will not. Uh, it was established in Durban and it wasn't meant to have an executive uh, uh, position. It was uh, uh, to speak on behalf of the Commonwealth at the UN and in other international uh, um, uh, gatherings, but not to have an executive role. Uh, soon, of course, thereafter, the role was expanded. And uh, we have seen right now uh, 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 that the United Kingdom uh, did, we must admit, in terms of concrete deliverables, did a fantastic job in delivering Chogon commitments like a fairer, prosperous, more sustainable, and more secure Commonwealth I've been reading their reports that have been submitted to Parliament, uh, and I say chapeau. Uh, I mean, they took leadership, they worked together with, with, with the BOG, and they have concrete things to deliver, because at the end of the day, the Commonwealth is about the Commonwealth citizen, and it has to be made relevant to the Commonwealth citizen. Obviously, uh, the Commonwealth cannot be everything to everyone. It cannot be a Christmas tree, a wish list. It has to find its niche uh, uh, in order to go forward. Now, another issue that I want to do, and please give me uh, the time up if, my, if, if I have a tendency to, to be a blabbermouth and, 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 and to take uh, um, uh, more of my time limit, is the role of the BOG. Uh, uh, the high commissioners, the way I see them and my experience, should be akin to organs of the United Nations and, and the high commissioners in London uh, should be like permanent representatives uh, 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 at the United Nations in New York on Geneva. Uh, the, true, the SG is answerable to heads and the, and the governments, uh, uh, but the SG must be guided by the program of work approved by the BOG, which provides another fundamental le leadership role. Uh, the, the high commissioners are the eyes and ears of their sovereigns. They are their countries' permanent representatives to the, uh, to the Commonwealth. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, and I say this uh, by way of objective, and, and Guy can obviously correct me uh, if I'm wrong, uh, uh, the High Commissioners cannot be downgraded or be seen as simply rubber, stamp, uh, rubber stampers, the BOG meeting once a year in order to, to rubber stamps, and when in fact we are not really sure what we are rubber stamping. 
many of the decisions are just have to be taken so quickly and cover so much ground. So on my watch, we had a lot more meetings than, uh, than, uh, than one. I counted seven or eight. I, I, I could be wrong because the, 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 the high commissioners are not simply there to parade in receptions. They're here to do work. Plus, we have so much other things to do, and, 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 uh, uh, and the Commonwealth takes a lot of our time. Uh, uh, another leadership role, of course, is CMAC, that we have to see if it has been effective because it assesses the violations of Commonwealth values and recommends measures to restore democracy and constitutional rule. Uh, um, we have to look at that uh, 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 in a more uh, um, piercing way. Uh, of course, a lot has been said about the Commonwealth networks. Uh, 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 I remember Lord Howell saying that the Commonwealth is the mother of all networks, and in many ways he's right. But how do all these things come together? How are they, harness, uh, how are they being harnessed? Amitav, in the previous uh, uh, um, uh, 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 discussion that we had, m mentioned more than 90. I think it's close to 100 now, uh, including the Jewish Council. How do these come together? And how do they feed into the overall structure and achieving the strategic goals of, 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 the, of the Commonwealth? Uh, there are so many events that we had to attend, and, I'm, and, and after so many years, I still do not know how they all uh, fit together. So, uh, uh, and different sources of leadership uh, obviously impact about, uh, uh, about the Commonwealth in whole and in part. So. I, uh, uh, last but not least, uh, of course, funding was mentioned, and of course, it's very, very important uh, uh, how that happens. But we all know the reasons why some of the richest countries have not uh, proceeded with funding. So we, the ABCs have to be on board just as much as everybody else has to be on board and vice, uh, and vice versa, of course. Now, last but not least, uh, of course, as diplomats, we have to be uh, optimistic. And uh, as it was said in the uh, previous uh, session, uh, uh, pessimists uh, never changed anything, but uh, uh, um, uh, optimists do. But we have to give a correct diagnosis uh, in order to prescribe the proper medicine. Uh, I am a little bit worried about the future of the Commonwealth. Uh, uh, um, in many ways, it is remarkable that it lasted so long. Uh, the Neherus, the Kenyatas, the Makarioses are no longer. You have new generation of leaders, young, uh, uh, sometimes nationalistic, not see how the Commonwealth fits in into the other structures that are around in the world. They see that often the Commonwealth as duplicating things that are done by others, regionalization, obviously is taking over in the case of the smallest group of the Commonwealth, uh, the, European, uh, the, the, uh, the European region, three, three members. Uh, uh, we have the European Union, and of course, we're sorry to see uh, uh, the United Kingdom leave because of Brexit. So you have two members of the Commonwealth that are members of the EU, which is Cyprus and Malta. So uh, uh, um, uh, these are some of the thoughts that I want to throw on the table and obviously ready to answer questions. Thank you for this opportunity. It's a great pleasure uh, to see you all. Uh, we have to thank technology for hashtag uh, uh, Zoom diplomacy and hybrid diplomacy as we are engaged right now. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Euripides. Um, I've always known you to be incredibly optimistic. So when you say you're a little bit worried about the future of the Commonwealth, I think that's something to take very seriously indeed. I'm also very struck by uh, two thoughts, uh, two expressions, that the Secretary General should be more of a secretary than a general. I'm, I'm sure there'll be some further views on that later in the discussion. But also, uh, an important thought, the Commonwealth cannot be a wish list. It cannot simply be the desires of 54 nations to present to the international community with the expectation that those desires will all be met. 
Um, I'm sure, Guy, uh, you'll have some some interesting perspectives on what both uh, Philip and Euripides had to say. Um, Guy, you are, of course, a former Barbadian uh, High Commissioner, um, but you're also now a senior researcher at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies here in the University of London. So you're very welcome, and we're looking forward to your remarks, please. Allow me first to record my thanks to our host, the organizers, and to our moderator, and to my distinguished panelists, to my fellow colleagues, and to us as a Commonwealth family. I thank you for giving me this time to talk to you. Um, just a bit about me for those I've not had yet the opportunity to meet. I've worked with four secretaries general from the Commonwealth, two as a member of staff of the Commonwealth Secretariat, and with two as a member of the Board of Governors. I am passionate about the Commonwealth, and I'm also very frank about what I think is wrong, but will also be constructive in terms of how I think we could go forward. There is a cloud of uncertainty that is over the next summit to be held next month in Kigali. And that is because there are considerably declining resources going out to the Commonwealth as an organization. But there's also this questioning of the relevance of the Commonwealth, and specifically the Commonwealth Secretariat, a part of which we are having a discussion today constructively in terms of how we can go forward. Others have said the summit is going to be impacted by, we know, a personally embattled chair in office and a host and a future chair where questions are being raised around issues of human rights records. So as we gather and as Prince Charles meets and starts to acclimate himself to his future role, we know the big discussion, the big focus is on the campaign, the issue of who will be the next Secretary General. People have often spoken to or tried to suggest that the Commonwealth really is just this colonial club yoked to Britain. But as Peter mentioned, er, sorry, Philip mentioned, the work that the Commonwealth did in the anti-apartheid struggle suggested that it could have an origin and a focus away from the interests of former colonial masters. And as some alluded to today as well, when Mozambique and Rwanda joined the Commonwealth, it reflected that countries were coming in because of shared values more so than a shared history of empire. But notwithstanding, and again, I heard people say that already this morning, the Commonwealth is at a crossroads. Its present and purpose is largely unknown to most Commonwealth citizens, and many of the member states are ambivalent about its current or future role. And in this context, if the Commonwealth is not just to merely survive, but to thrive, urgent action is necessary. Someone alluded to earlier about the role of CMAG, about this unique function and, and mechanism that tried to make sure that member states upheld and adhered to the Commonwealth's fundamental values. And we saw in the past members being suspended for violations, but there has been criticisms against the Commonwealth in its failure to act. This over-reliance on peer pressure or moral suasion is not enough. And we know that recently there has been serious charges against the Commonwealth for overlooking human rights abuses, particularly with regard to issues of sexual orientation, specifically anti-LGBTQ plus laws in the Commonwealth. 
we have to understand that we have to interrogate where we are going and how we are doing things if we are going to stay relevant. I spoke on the earlier session about this issue of the Commonwealth Network, and I think it's an important part of the leadership issue within the Commonwealth. Because the Commonwealth Secretariat has become too often synonymous with the Commonwealth, when in fact there are three intergovernmental organizations and over 80 professional and civil society organizations. And as I said earlier, the challenge is, notwithstanding this discussion about a network of organizations, it has been at best lip service being paid by the Secretariat towards trying to make effective synergies and partnerships within this Commonwealth network of organizations. Insufficient attention has been given to coordinate strategies, plans, and programs which would maximize visibility and to, sh and to make sure that there is an appreciation of the role and value of the Commonwealth. And to a certain extent, which Euripides just mentioned, the, sec the Commonwealth Secretariat has failed to appreciate that it could work effectively as an interregional hub for the burgeoning um, regionalism that has dominated now what is a cu the current multipolar global order. You've got CARICOM and the SADAC and you've got the Pacific Island Forums and the Commonwealth as a, a cross-continental network could bring them together. It has a unique position to facilitate that interface and it has not done that enough. It has always wanted to position itself as exclusive when if it was more inclusive in bringing those regional organizations together into a meaningful network and having meaningful dialogues, it could multiply its impact on the ground. Part of this happens to be, again, this London-centric operating base. When I was at the Secretariat and I had the opportunity to work with the Commonwealth Youth Programme, and it had a regional network to deliver the youth work, and it was very innovative. But what we did not do was to keep that or upgrade those regional offices to become satellites of the Commonwealth so that in every region there would be a tangible Commonwealth presence that could interface both with governments and the regional organization so that people would understand what and who and how the Commonwealth could work. Regarding the head of the Commonwealth, as again the point was made, Prince William, following his Caribbean tour, indicated that he didn't mind not being the head of the Commonwealth, possibly in the future, and felt that someone else could do this outside of the royal family. And as someone who has just supported republicanism in Barbados and believe of the Commonwealth's right to self-determination, I don't necessarily agree with this notion of democratizing the headship. In 2018, when we were getting leading into the preparations for the summit, I said one of the biggest dangers to the continued existence of the Commonwealth was not dealing with this succession issue. If you think it is difficult to elect a Secretary General, try to get ahead of the Commonwealth, where every country feels its citizen would be best suited. It's not about holding on to monarchical ties or old baggage. It's a simple and pragmatic reality. Until we find a solution that could work, we have to keep the one that is. And it is for this reason that Barbados got very involved in trying to ensure that there was that continuity in leadership, and we were thankful that it happened in 2018, or we might be in a mad scramble today. 
about the Secretary and the Secretary General. The Secretary, as I said earlier, is seen as a de facto leading organization in the Commonwealth family. But what, we have a challenge with that organization. We are seeing too many ad hoc changes in structures and programs, and it has led to an intense criticism of the organization. And many of us, and let us be frank, have seen in the public domain the, 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 the fights and the pointing and critiques of seemingly lack of transparency and accountability within the organization itself. Governments have raised issues about a lack of clarity of program structure and also about variable qualities in the work produced. And as a result, members, I am interpreting, are communicating their dismay over the failings of the organization by withholding funds. It's not accidental. It is their way of communicating their lack of confidence in the organization, and we therefore have to address that. And it has been hard for me to, at this point, come to terms with the fact that someone that I like personally and shares Caribbean roots is seen by many as not possibly being able to take the organization forward in the future. And this is a political reality. This is how change comes about within political spheres. When someone is not performing, other people stand up to fill that void. And it is not about saying change for change's sake. There is, I think, a point that we are trying to say we need to embark on a new direction if the Commonwealth is to remain viable for the future. And I get a sense from all the discussions about that heads are giving serious consideration to the possibility of alternate candidates and speaking from CARICOM as a CARICOM citizen and in the interest of the continuity, both of women in top positions and also for the Caribbean's presence, I hope that they will give serious consideration to the candidate being proposed by Jamaica. But this, again, cannot be an issue of just making a change of protest. There is a problem in the way the Secretary General of the Commonwealth of Nations functions. Heads have created a bureaucratic monster by establishing a post that is exclusively accountable to them. And secretaries general will consistently tell you they don't account, as Euripides is saying, as alluded to, to the Board of Governors or even to foreign ministers. They feel that they only have an accountability to heads, and I probably believe their creator. And what we need is a new system. We need a new system of governance that says in between the summits that there is a council of ministers, I would presume foreign ministers, who are able to ensure that the work of the Secretariat and the work done by the Secretary General is done consistent with Commonwealth principles and good governance practices. That, unfortunately, does not obtain presently. There has to be a way of ensuring that the Board of Governors and their committees continue to provide monitoring and effective controls over the Secretariat and supporting the Secretary General in between those ministerial meetings. It is a time for change. It is a time to say enough is enough. At one of her past speeches at a head of government meeting, the Queen cautioned that we must not take the continued presence of the Commonwealth for granted. And I interpreted that as a regal acknowledgement, albeit skillfully worded, that continuing along the present path, a path of dissent and decline, 
may prove fatal for the Commonwealth. And therefore, I come to this conference and I hope in Kigali that something will be done so that we can ensure the Commonwealth's survival and that it thrives in the future. But we can't just hope in 10 years. We have to take the necessary actions right now. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Guy. That was a very passionate exposition of uh, your ideas, things you clearly believe in very strongly. I'd like to draw out uh, a few of those thoughts to stimulate the discussion going forward. The idea that the Commonwealth is at a crossroads and the presence of the Commonwealth and the purpose of the Commonwealth is not something that is necessarily known by most of its citizens. The idea of the viability of structures like CMAG, how credible they are in the international community, and tying into the idea that the Secretariat, for whatever reason, uh, may only be able to pay lip service to some of the most important issues facing the world today. But also, very importantly, uh, the issue of whether reform of the structures, reform of the processes should be addressed forthwith. Um, I'm sure some of those ideas are going to grip your interest and engagement. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Just a quick reminder, you can now tweet at Commonwealth Roundtable. Um, I'm sure some of those ideas will translate across into the journal and the website um, in future weeks and months. But uh, I'd now like to open uh, the discussion to the floor and uh, please if you could wait for the microphone to come to you uh, before speaking and uh, keep your remarks quite brief because uh, we have a lot of comments to get through. Um, Carl, please wait for the mic. Thank you. Thanks, uh, and thanks again for organising this like everybody else. It's great to see so many familiar faces and friends in the room, and um, you know, it's, it's really encouraging after all this time being, being locked up, as it were. Yeah, um, when I was um, a Secretary General for about 20 odd years, I like to be more of a general than a secretary. <laughs> I um, left the, the taking of minutes to others and maybe edited them, but, but certainly prefer to focus on more strategic issues than, than administration. Yeah, which, which others could do better than me. Um, and I think that there's a lesson there for the Secretariat uh, as well. Uh, and I would tend to disagree with Philip that we, we abolish the chair in office. I think certainly um, we all agree probably that Sonny Rampol was the most successful Secretary General. But I think he's also very successful because he had some real dynamic leaders behind him. Indira Gandhi, Michael Manley, Julius Nereri, Bob Hawke. Uh, many of those great Commonwealth leaders were, were solidly, actively involved um, with, with, with him and backing him. So I think there has to be a close engagement with heads. And I'm not sure abolishing the chain off is, is a good idea. Uh, and certainly when I was, you know, my small organization um, involved, I was, um, although trying to be a general, I was always very conscious of what my chair said and, and my board members who were from all Commonwealth countries at very senior levels. And if, if I was successful, it's because I engaged them in my work. So just, just two points to conclude with. Um, one is I think um, the, the Secretary General and the leadership does need to address um, key focal strategic issues uh, and, and make sure that there is a uh, organization that doesn't spread itself too thin. And climate change is an obvious one I think where the you know, Commonwealth can play a role. And then finally, I do think it's worth putting in context, which I think somebody said already this morning, which is that um, the Commonwealth is not unique in, in being in crisis. Um, there is a crisis of multilateralism, and, and just as leaders play a role in influence the Commonwealth, we've seen the rise of populism, we've seen the rise of xenophobia, including in countries like Britain and, and India and others across the world. And so I think um, there is a, a real issue which the Commonwealth is only part of, 
which is um, how do we preserve multilateralism, how do we preserve um, kind of liberal democracy values which are being challenged by China and Russia and others in, in the world which the Commonwealth espouses. And so again, I think this is something where the Secretary General, the leadership of the Commonwealth has to be a general rather than a secretary. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for that, Cole. Um, I'm sure those, those issues will be perennial, but uh, for the moment, I think uh, we do have to focus on the issue of leadership, uh, leadership particularly when the world, not just the Commonwealth, faces such issues and challenges. Arif. Just very quickly, there was several mentions of, of CMAG. CWAG, people may never have heard of, but actually it was agreed at the last Women's Affairs Minister's meeting to constitute a Commonwealth Women's Affairs Advisory Group. Nobody's ever heard of it. Nobody's ever, there's been no transparency about what it's going to do. So I think the idea of, uh, and I think that, but there may be value in identifying cross-cutting areas like gender and possibly others that need added accountability. So my question is, are there, examples like that we could consider, but my goodness, let's consider the follow-through. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, the issue of gender has come up many times over, over the past few decades, and uh, the question of accountability is probably the one we need to, to look at quickly. Um, I'd just like to, to issue a reminder to those, those in the audience who are joining by Zoom that you can contribute to the discussion. Um, and if you'd like to make a comment, please feel free to, to alert us on the, on the chat. Um, Alex. Thank you. Um, this one is, in fact, um, an online question from Terry Dormer. Um, he says, would it not be a good idea for the election of the Secretary General to be decided before Chogham and announced at the beginning of the first session, thus avoiding difficult discussions about the issue and facilitating exchanges of views and decisions on more important global matters. Um, and I think <laughs> I may throw in my own question. Um, Briefly, yes. I think everyone takes the point, um, and, and, and you know, it's inarguable that the Commonwealth can't be everything to everyone, and it can't be a Christmas tree. Uh, and Philip made a very good point that it should concentrate on one or two things that it's good at. Um, I suppose my question is in two parts. Uh, one is, what are the one and two things that the Commonwealth is good at? Uh, and the second is, if it concentrates on those, how does it remain nimble enough to change its priorities and, and its areas of focus? Philip, I think that's a, a question you should address. Um, I think we can come back to the other question of the contest uh, later in the discussion. So. I, can, I, can I round up a few questions? Um, Arif, I'm afraid I don't think CWAG is going to catch on um, for, for, for various reasons. Um, Carl, I mean, I think you slightly started to deconstruct your own point by talking about Sonny Ramphal and the leaders he maintained a relationship with. I mean, um, I think the problem with having a chair in office is perhaps it suggests there is one, one kind of Commonwealth head, head of government who should be responsible for this and slightly lets the onus off that, that relationship building. But, but I think there's a, more, there's a more important reason why I think that you've seen recently why that having the chair in office is such a bad idea, that really if the, if the Commonwealth was serious about things like climate change, it would, have, it would have held an online meeting on the eve of COP26. It should have, uh, it, but it didn't. Partly, uh, so far as I can see, reading the runes, I'm not privy to these things because Rwanda was so keen to hang on to the privilege of hosting. And that's, that's not good for the Commonwealth. Um, um, Terry's point, I think, is an excellent one, and I, I completely agree with it. You look back at the last Chogums, what dominated the headlines? 2011, the eminent persons group. 2013, the fact that it was happening in Sri Lanka. 2015, the election of Patricia Scotland, 2018, 
the, the decision about the headship. It's all navel-gazing. Not, not outward looking. It's all about inward internal processes. So get the internal, the big internal decision out of the way. And finally, and finally, Alex's point. Look, I think you can you can say what the the, the the big question is: for what problems is the Commonwealth a logical framework for discussion? And it's not climate change because climate change doesn't stop at a border when you stop speaking English and start speaking French. Not particularly, not particularly COVID. It's not particularly development. It's things where you have a kind of a shared history. And this is why history matters. Things like systems of law, systems of government, local government, perhaps, um, where, where, where there is a kind of a common historical framework. Reparations as well, which is, the big, is going to be the big one in the future. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, I wonder, Euripides, whether, whether you'd like to pick up on some of those remarks and uh, some <coughs> responses to some of the questions. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think it is uh, for the benefit of, for, of brevity and for avoiding repetition. Uh, when, when I said that the Secretary General must be more of a Secretary than a General, I was also speaking from from my own experience and from the experience of other high commissioners, uh, because we are the ones that have the daily uh, the daily uh, uh, contact with the with, with the secretary general and uh, with the uh, with the comsec. Nobody, of course, is stopping the secretary general uh, uh, from talking to heads and to um, and to the foreign ministers. But as Guy said, we were seen as, as often as, it, you know, marginal. I mean, let's have some high commissioners and invite them here and there uh, uh, in receptions. That's not our purpose. I did not serve in London in order to be paraded in, uh, uh, in receptions. I went there to do a job. And the Commonwealth is one of many things that a high commissioner is supposed to do. So I would say more of a secretary than a general, uh, because the secretary general is the servant of the member states is the servant of the heads. It's not one of the heads, as we are often led to believe, that since the Secretary General is appointed by the head, uh, then the Secretary General is, should be treated as a head. No, that's not the case. That's not the case at the United Nations. That's not the case anywhere. And, 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 uh, and the Commonwealth is no exception. Now, finding the niche, yes. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what that niche might be. Blue Charter comes in mind. Uh, uh, um, the, the, the things that uh, Prince Charles is doing, urbanization, sustainability. Uh, but obviously, when you have 54 uh, um, heads spending so much time together in, in Chogoms, obviously they want to come back to their respective audience and say, listen, this was of interest to us and, of, and it's in the communique. But uh, I, I think we, we are deceiving ourselves uh, if we think, and we, we are not able to deliver, because we are trying to be all things to all people. There are, there, there is, there should be greater, for instance, cooperation with regional organizations in order to avoid duplication and to develop synergies. Uh, the European Union is a case in point. We we, we tried to do it. Uh, still, there is work in progress. Uh, uh, it's unfortunate that the United Kingdom did not do it when it was a member of the European Union in, in the case of, of, of uh, uh, observance of elections. The, United, uh, the European Union has a lot of a key on that. We could work with them. We could work with other regional organizations in order to avoid duplication and minimize uh, the cost. And obviously, there has to be transparency. There has to be accountability. The, the BOG, the Board of Governors, cannot ask things from the Secretariat and, this, and somehow these things are, are, not, uh, are not honored. Now, mind you, and I don't, I don't want to take much of your time to give more time for, uh, for discussion and answer, to the degree that, as it has been said, that the uh, Commonwealth is a secretariat-driven organization is because the member states allowed it to become one. So member states have a responsibility as well. We should not be pointing the finger to, to the, uh, constantly to, the, to others, to the SG, to the secretariat, and I don't know where else the member states. And that has to do with the fact that the Commonwealth is not right up there. 
in the priorities of the foreign policy of, 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 of many of our countries, because obviously, uh, I, I'm not saying anything earth-shaking, uh, uh, the world is, we're having, we're having tectonic shifts, uh, crisis of multilateralism has been said, crisis in the, in the supply chains, food security problems, I mean, so many things. So uh, uh, the, the ministries, I was political director of my ministry and, and the Commonwealth, uh, and I was permanent secretary at some point, the Commonwealth really never figured. So we also have to make it more important on the domestic scene and, uh, and, to, uh, uh, and in our ministries of foreign affairs so that, so, so, so that it can fit in. And I'm just simply, I repeat, speaking the, from experience. Uh, uh, they're one of the practitioner. Thank you very much, and, uh, and I hope I didn't take too much wrong about it. Just feel free to interrupt me. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Euripides. Um, Guy, um, did you want to pick up on some of those issues? Could development, for example, be an issue that the Commonwealth could take up the, the challenge of, particularly when Western governments have been cutting back? I think the point that is being raised by everyone here is that there, the organization, given especially its limited funding and also limited staff resources, can't be all things to all people. And therefore, there has to be a mechanism through which you are able to distill and determine what are the priorities. How you do that is the challenge and what we, we have recognized up to today that we have not been able to do that effectively. And this is part of the challenge or where we find ourselves today in, in this symposium, but I think within the wider discourse around the, the Commonwealth about the serious operational challenges that the Commonwealth is facing. This family of nations is very dysfunctional. And if we continue, and, and with the greatest of respect to all the optimists, I look at this very pragmatically, that if we don't make the interventions that are necessary now, the likelihood of us being able to gather in 10 years' time and say we are where we would like to be or should be is going to be less possible. And, and, and so it's really about that. Coming to terms with, as both of the sessions today have, have screamed about, that some of the fundamentals about this network and how it functions need to get resolved. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed for that. I mean, um, inherent in, in our discussions this morning is the question that has come up time and again. Is, is the use of the word family and the informality that naturally goes with it becoming something of a hindrance for the Commonwealth in the modern era? Um, I just throw that open for discussion and um, addressing whether, whether it makes it more difficult to take tough decisions, particularly within the circles of the Commonwealth. Um, but further thoughts on any of the issues are warmly welcomed. Um, Sandy. Thank you very much, and to, to all three speakers and, and the chair for a, a very exciting session, still ongoing exciting, I think. Um, there's been reference by all the speakers to the three main offices in the Commonwealth, um, and I think there is more than one elephant in the room. There are quite a few elephants now, and I'd like to name another. Uh, and what I'm about to say does not um, imply any position on my part in terms of which of the contending candidates um, should 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 uh, become the next or the continuing Secretary General, and there are indeed different views on the merits, abilities, uh, style of the incumbent and of any possible other contender or contenders. That's not the purpose of my remark. The purpose of my remark is about um, diplomatic and governance principles and processes. Um, the, when you have an animal such as a chair in office in an international organisation, fundamental principle of such a role is that it should be operating impartially. If it's to have credibility, if it's not to demean or divert the organisation and indeed to divert the, that office. We don't have that right now. Um, the British government has taken a um, political, uh, partisan, arguably party political 
arguably ad hominem or ad feminine position about uh, the current Secretary General. And in my view, um, that is inappropriate and not helpful. There are 53 other member governments who, if they wish to opine on who should be retained in office or running for office, and indeed what the process for that, given that it originated in the COVID shock lockdown and the loss of two years of drug and fine. Those are principles and procedures to be debated. Um, but when that position that has recently been taken um, is presented as a, the British position or the British government's position and not the position of one person who happens to be prime minister and his immediate circle, I personally, not just as a British citizen, but as a former senior Commonwealth official, uh, have to disassociate myself from that process and that lack of observation of principle. Thank you very much for, for raising that issue. Um, I'd also like to throw in um, the question whether, whether people in the audience, both on Zoom and here in the room, uh, feel that the addition of the chair in office has added to the leadership of the Commonwealth, or if it's hindered the leadership of the Commonwealth. But Philip, I know, I know you're well, keen to, yeah. to address I, that I last question. Yeah, sure. no, I mean, I think we could do a bit of some public service here because um, um, I, there's a question. I think if, if anyone knows the answer, it would probably be someone in this room. Uh, um, they, of course, there's a, there's a row broken out. It's been a bit slow brewing, um, but it's in The Guardian now about the role of the chair in, chair in office. Now, David Lammy tweeted about this, um, and it's quoted in The Guardian today or yesterday. Um, Lamy says, the chair of the Commonwealth is supposed to maintain neutrality and confidentiality. Now, I want to know where the definition of the role of chair is, which mentions those two terms. Does anyone know? I mean, uh, the, the, it, it's, not, it's not in the, the original communique which created the post. Mm -hmm. It's not in the, the, the end of persons group says that it's the post was one of the problems of the post, it's ill-defined. I think Lamy was basically making, making the definition up on the hoof. Mm -hmm. And I mean, look, logically, I mean, a, a chair in office can't be expected to take a kind of vow of political celibacy for two years or however much, much longer, longer it is. They're still a player. Um, so, so I want to, I mean, you know, what's the definition of the role of the chair in office? There isn't one. No, no, I don't think there is. It's but it's, some, it's something that perhaps in a, a wider context, the round table could, could take up that particular yeah. issue. I think uh, there would be really vibrant debate around it. Um, Guy. Um, it's an interesting analogy that Philip raises about celibacy with regard to <laughs> with current chair in office. Yes, but the point being, and I, I want to say that <laughs> we need, yes, we need to lighten the, the discourse a bit. <laughs> but I want to say, and Euripides would know this, having been chair, that when somebody assumes the role of chair, the country still has to have a voice. And this is the point that Philip is saying. It does not negate the, the UK being involved. So that the UK government can take a position. And it is reasonable that they can be in favor. And it, it's not to me whether they favor the incumbent or a new candidate as them. It's respecting that right. Now, how they do it, and I think the need to give clarity from a country's position and that role of chair in office would be helpful. But as Philip is making the point, that there, that is not defined. And so it makes it impossible to, to speak to it. Thank you very much. A perfect moment to go briefly to Catherine, Euripides to, um, to talk uh, for a moment about uh, the management of that role of chair in office, given political ramifications. Uh, uh, true, uh, true the, the role of the chair in office is, is not defined, uh, but we all know in our gut how a chair should work. Obviously, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the delegation in which he or she represents have a voice. My experience 
as chair of, of, the, of the Board of Governors for two years, I did not allow my delegation to take the floor once to say anything. Because simply, you know, the chairmanship it almost, it has to be almost like Caesar's wife. She must not only be virtuous, she must also appear to be virtuous. So I didn't want anybody to think that I had an agenda and I wasn't able to say things as chair, but I was having my delegation say that. So I simply did not give the floor to my delegation. I, uh, the instructions were not to take the floor about anything in order to really have credibility uh, 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 and, and, and have honesty in advertising. Uh, now, I think the chair in office, as I said, and I agree with Philip, and I think with Guy that, that it is not defined, uh, but it will take us a lot, a lot of time to define it, what a chair in office is supposed to do, is supposed not to do. I think we have it. Uh, we should work with it. It is a troika, and perhaps in the future, why not? Uh, the chair in office uh, 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 can be, you know, if, if things don't work out with the royal family, it can be the, the head of the Commonwealth for the duration of the time that uh, they have the chair in office. We have it in the in the EU, and it, you know what? And it works very, very well. It works very, very fine without having a celibacy vow. So we do have best practices out there, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, with the necessary changes, obviously can be adopted in order to, to feed uh, uh, our Commonwealth uh, family. And yes, the Commonwealth in chair, uh, I think it, uh, it has brought an added value to the leadership role uh, of the Commonwealth than as if not, not to have it. Uh, uh, things cannot be everywhere and nowhere. We cannot have a situation of laissez-aller. Laissez we can all have a situation where the Commonwealth is, a, is just simply a talking shop. As good as the talking shop might be, uh, you know, you have to come down to concrete deliverables. And as and, and, and Guy said, to identify the difficulties to identify these niches because you have uh, uh, um, financial, I mean, infinite needs, but finite human and financial resources. Go to the Ministry of, of, uh, of Economics nowadays to, to get more money for the Commonwealth. Good luck. I mean, I, 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 I asked, and, 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 and the Ministry of Finance for us is, is ministry now, especially in these times after COVID and uh, so many other things. So this is my small contribution, and, uh, and, and, and I really like, like it. It's an, exciting, uh, 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 it's an exciting panel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Euripides. Uh, I won't uh, uh, quote you again, but uh, I have to say, I think there's a future in accumulating some of your quotations <laughs> about the Commonwealth. Um, some interesting issues to, to digest and to process. Uh, another, another idea just to throw in that came from earlier this morning, I think it was Indrajit who talked about the importance of catalyzing the Commonwealth at this stage in its history and its evolution. Um, but I know there are views coming from the floor, so please. Uh, James Chirin, I'm the senior fellow here at the Institute and the former editor of uh, Commonwealth and Comparative Politics. Uh, I think one thing uh, that this very stimulating uh, uh, panel has, uh, the discussion already that is, uh, we have heard, has communicated is that leadership is also about, it's a dynamic process. It's, it's engendered and it's engendered by the environment within which it is exercised. So people have mentioned Sony Ramphal, and it's also le true to a lesser extent of the Secretary Generals of the United Nations, how their role has changed over time. And it's also not an accident that Sony Ramphal was Secretary General for 15 years, and he's the only Secretary general to have served that, uh, that long. So there are, it's, it's a marriage between uh, a person's rising to leadership and the circumstances that exist. And the circumstances that exist today are not propitious, uh, to say the least. So, so as far as the Commonwealth is concerned, it's really about making the Commonwealth relevant to the challenges that the world fa faces today. The institutional leadership has a role in that, 
but it goes much wider than that. And I think that's what's come across from the previous panel and this panel. Uh, just a couple of points about the Secretary General and the headship. About the Secretary General, I mean, Philip, you suggested that uh, having to run for a second term is a handicap. So what's the solution to that? Have a six-year term, a single six-year term for, uh, for the Secretary General? That's possibly uh, something that, that could be done. Uh, the headship is, I, I'm wondering, why, do, why does the Commonwealth need a figure? I mean, the United Nations, yes, it has uh, a, a, a monthly president of the Security Council, uh, 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 chair of the General Assembly. But the United Nations doesn't have a figurehead like the Commonwealth. Many organizations don't. So why headship? And if so, yes, if there had to be a figurehead, the, uh, the chair in office could just as well be the figurehead. So I don't see why. Uh, there needs to be a figure. Yeah. Um, that process of evolution, clearly, we're already seeing that in practice. Certainly some of the um, discussions that have come forth this year after various uh, foreign tours and uh, discussions in, in the UK as well, um, looking ahead to Kigali and uh, those those very heated emotions that have already emerged in connection with the um, Secretary General competition or contest. Um, but one of the issues that I think is, is really important to have a look at is the question of consensus, whether consensus is, is another issue that's hindering the Commonwealth from making the decisions that are really in its favour and having open competition. Um, I would like just to reference the fact that Kenya's Monica Juma initially uh, contested uh, or ran and expressed interest for the Secretary General's role, but uh, withdrew on the basis that uh, there was an inability to get Caribbean support, of course, but uh, in a wider sense if no consensus on the Secretary General future position is reached, uh, no Secretary General can actually be declared. And um, that could be a very awkward position for the Commonwealth to be in. Um, how, how likely you think that is, is, is possibly an area for discussion this morning. But uh, before we go to that, some thoughts. Um, first and foremost, I'm a complete outsider. I don't know anybody in the room. Welcome. I introduced myself to a young lady who is a student. And um, because I'm a complete outsider, I'm listening with um, a fresh, fresh, fresh ear. And it just seems there's a lot of um, in-house dialogue going on, which I, I don't understand. But two questions that came to me is that, what are ABCs? I know I don't know who or what they represent. <laughs> And then the big question is, what is the Commonwealth for? What is it for? What is its purpose? Because um, the young people who are out there, they need to know this. Why are we fighting to keep something that we don't understand? I'm not a young person, I'm an elder. And that's my question. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, perhaps I can bring in Stuart Mole uh, at this point. Um, what is the Commonwealth for, <laughs> Stuart? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not sure I'm going to accept that. <laughs> but I do think that, um, uh, that we have probably under... One, one of the questions that I, I've previously sparred with Philip on this. And one of the things that I don't think Philip's had a convincing answer to is why is it that when countries leave, and I'm not sure we can stop them leaving in the way that he implies, 
But when countries leave or they're expelled or they're suspended or whatever, why do they come back? Mm -hmm. And they yeah. do. Yeah. And, and others want to, yeah. uh, to join too. And, and so if the organization is <coughs> hurtling to oblivion, um, which it, it, you know, I know there's a strong argument for putting that, um, uh, why is it that we still have people who, for whatever reason, want to invest in the organization? Um, now, I, you know, I accept that there are very considerable challenges because we have had a failure of leadership for some time in the organization. And it is, I've said this many occasions, an organization of option. It's not an organization of obligation. And we are in bad times as far as multilateral organizations are concerned. We all know that. And the Commonwealth is not isolated from that. We've had some disastrous Commonwealth meetings. Uh, Philip, I think, was scarred by, as we all were, Colombo in, uh, in 2013, and we never want to see an a, a meeting like that, where actually the heads were allowed, this is them overriding the secretary, if you like, they were allowed to have that meeting, and then they voted with their feet, and many of them and stayed away from it. And we had a kind of hollowed out, awful meeting, with a terrible communicator that simply ticked the box of what everybody else had done, but said nothing what the, the Commonwealth itself was doing. Um, I do hope we're not going to repeat that in Kigali. Uh, there are some issues we haven't yet mentioned <laughs> that may float up in Kigali. Um, but um, I, I, I think at the same time, um, I don't think uh, we can say that there is no chance of having leadership. I don't think we can say that those problems that Philip um, outlined are deep-rooted, structural, and there's a sort of deterministic slide to the end. I don't think that's true, because you see in the Commonwealth this capacity for renewal in different parts of the network going on. Commonwealth Games is a classic example of this. Um, but I do hope, and I, and I think you know, we are an organic organization uh, that contracts and expands uh, according to how it is used and how people are prepared to provide leadership. Uh, and I am not, therefore, pessimistic. One of the things we got this morning from Indrajit was, earlier this morning, was a reminder that we don't actually have to have something intrinsic to Commonwealth nations to be a platform for ideas and a platform for action that we can take to a wider international community. Uh, Indrajit mentioned debt, very important issue. He mentioned small states, uh, where again, we took on to, a, it became a broader uh, uh, universal issue, of course, but we shouldn't discount what we were able to do uh, in that instance. And um, so I, I, I wouldn't be pessimistic, but what I would say if, uh, in, in, in going forward from Kigali and hoping that we ignore, we, we avoid uh, the disasters, um, that we don't then think that there is this dichotomy between either having a Secretary General who must talk to heads all the time and must engage with heads, which I think he or she must, but that doesn't mean neglecting uh, the whole governance structures. No, no Secretary General that I ever worked with, and I worked with three, ever did that to ignore, and I think some have. But, but the, you know, I, I don't like the idea of thinking that your Secretary General mustn't engage with heads and mustn't challenge them and mustn't do some quite extraordinary things in terms of leadership which have enabled the Commonwealth to do great things. So I'm sorry, I haven't answered your question. I do apologise for that, but then I'm not up there. So. Thank you so much for taking the curved ball, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, um, I think your, your response has given us some idea of the flexibility of the Commonwealth and the ability actually to respond to most issues as they arise with, with some kind of interesting perspectives from, um, from a group of nations that really represents the interests of a great many people in the world, 2.5 billion people. Um, and in answer to, to your first question about ABC, um, I'm not sure if you've already had clarification on that, but it's Australia, Britain, and Canada, of 
course. Um, are there further <coughs> contributions from the floor in this room? Amitav. Thanks very much. I, I, I don't want to put my floor in uh, to this debate too much, but I just did want to answer Philip, who was responding to Sandy. Uh, there is no definition of the role of the chair in office. And the, the role got into pretty quick controversy soon after it was formed over the issue of Zimbabwe. When CMAC couldn't resolve the issue of Zimbabwe, they passed it on to a troika. Mm -hmm. And the troika consisted of the current role, uh, the current chair, the previous chair, and the chair to be. And um, it led eventually to a Southern African revolt against what they thought, what they thought was a cabal. The chair in office was the then Australian Prime Minister John Howard, who was seen as having been in cahoots with a, a New Zealand Secretary General Don McKinnon and a very assertive British Prime Minister called Tony Blair, who uh, basically treated Zimbabwe very unfairly. Zimbabwe withdrew from the Commonwealth and it caused a major ruction within the Commonwealth. So uh, the chair in office attempted to have more than just a ceremonial role and it came to grief pretty early. Um, on the question that Sandy raised, I think it is absolutely true that every country has a country position, and the chair in office belongs to a country, and that country has a position. Um, Yuri, I think, is very rare in saying that I instructed the Cyprus delegation to always keep its mouth shut <laughs> when I was in the chair. That doesn't always happen. Uh, but I think what uh, Philip Lamy uh, reacted to was the fact that Boris Johnson said this. He didn't clarify that he was speaking as UK. Um, he was easily picked as speaking as chair. And this was seen in, in a particular context because for quite some time, the UK was seen as having desperately tried to find someone to stand against the incumbent Secretary General, and therefore it was invested with particular significance. If I was sitting in number 10 uh, advising Mr. Johnson, or sitting in the Foreign Office advising Ms. Truss, I would have said, could you please ask the Prime Minister to keep his counsel to himself? Uh, Kigali is not far away. You are very welcome in that closed room in the retreat to say what Britain wants. But unfortunately, you are creating political football here. And I'm afraid the Belize Prime Minister has gone and does exact, done exactly the same. He has, uh, he's chair of CARICOM. He has not only said, um, we have decided that every country can vote for itself, but he has gone ahead and said Belize supports the Jamaican candidate. So uh, I'm afraid the whole thing has got extremely messy, and it is going to be extremely difficult to resolve this mess because it looks like a fight to the finish. Mm. Thank you so much for that, Amitav. Um, I'm afraid that we are out of time on our extremely vibrant discussion, but um, I'd just like to take the opportunity to ask you to, to give thanks to Euripides in Cyprus. Oh, Euripides, did you want to? I don't want our, our student friend who asked the question about the, of the ABCs and which you explained to be shortchanged, but uh, uh, the fact that she, uh, she asked a very basic question, uh, 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 what is the Commonwealth, what does it do, what is its purpose, I think it speaks volumes, because, uh, uh, because the youth are not the leaders of tomorrow, they are the leaders of today, so if those basic questions are asked, uh, 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 from our uh, friend uh, and student, then I think we should really go, all of us go back to the drawing board and see how we can do name recognition and how to have more impact because, uh, 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 you know, we maybe we as a panel are in a bubble uh, uh, and the world out there doesn't really know anything about it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Euripides. But uh, thank you very much indeed for all your contributions, Philip Euripides and Guy. Um, we've had one of the most animated discussions on the Commonwealth that uh, I've heard in, in many years. And um, I think that was a real call to action from each of our speakers to, to go out and really look at the Commonwealth 
and see it in its current context and what the Commonwealth can do for the future, in particular in galvanising the energy of the population of the Commonwealth nations, which, as I said, amounts to 2.5 billion people around the world. That has to be some resource. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.